Hello and welcome to On The Ledge podcast. I'm your host, Jane Perone, and I've got a bit of a thing about plants. Every time I turn on the mic, I get a feeling of euphorbia at joining you to talk about plants. And in this week's episode, it's compact and bijou, as the estate agent would say. A short episode where I profile three extinct houseplants. Now, when I say extinct, I don't mean extinct, extinct, as in no longer existing anywhere on the planet. I just mean plants that are still around, but no longer grown in houses. And I don't actually have any scientific proof that no single dwelling on the whole of this planet has one of these plants growing. And maybe you can prove me wrong, but they seem to have completely dropped out of the palette of plants that we use in our homes. But before that, this Quick announcement about my Hampton Court Palace live podcast recording on the evening of Friday, the 8th of July, 2022. Congratulations. Go to Emily Singer Ripley, who won a pair of tickets to the show in the prize draw I held on Instagram. Looking forward to meeting you, Emily. And I mentioned a special guest. Well, I can now announce that I'm going to be joined by the delightful Janelle Leon of Cactus Shop Prick to talk all things houseplants. I think we're going to have a blast. So check out the show notes for details about how to get your tickets to the Flowers After Hours event at Hampton Court. We will be on stage in the Marketplace Theatre at 9pm. Thanks also to Will for becoming a legend this week. I really appreciate everyone who makes a regular financial donation to the show, but I know that's not possible for everybody. And a shout out to one particular patron. There may be others of you in this boat who have had to stop their patronage because they need to save up money to move somewhere safer because they live in the US. So, yeah, I I can I feel you. (laughs) I really feel you. And of course, You have to prioritise your own safety and I totally understand if you are in that camp and you can no longer donate to Patreon. How would you like to own a houseplant that smells of roast beef crisps when you give it a squeeze? Well, who wouldn't? (laughs) Perhaps that's just me. But the first extinct houseplant that I'm going to talk about offers just that kind of scent experience for your nose. Its scientific name is Glecoma hederacea. Now, scientific Latin fans may detect from that second part of the name, hederacea, that this plant looks a little bit like hederahelix, the English ivy. And indeed, this plant is often commonly known as ground ivy. It's native to pretty much the whole of Europe, stretching into Russia, and it has become naturalised in large parts of North America and some parts of South America, and indeed is a bit of an invasive weed there. It's a member of the mint family, so you may recognise the square stems and the little purple flowers, which look a bit like mint flowers. The leaves are attractive they're round scalloped heart shaped and usually creeping along the ground hence one of its other common names creeping charlie although as is so often the case that name is also used for a few other plants some of which are house plants including pilea numularifolia how do i know this used to be grown as a house plant well i'm referring back she says flicking through the pages to the old favorite The Houseplant Expert by Dr. David Hesseon. I've also seen it in quite a few other houseplant books of the period. Just trying to find the page now. (laughs) Ficus, no, here we go. 
And when I look it up in this book, uh, it's usually almost always the variegated form of glaucoma heteracea that we're seeing as a house plant, which has got creamy margins to the edges of the leaves. The gold plated houseplant expert does note that hardly any houseplant suppliers in Britain offer it for sale or have even heard of it. So even back then, perhaps it wasn't that popular. But I have looked at various other books and found mentions of it. So it clearly was being grown indoors. A couple more interesting things about glaucoma heteracea. As I said, roast beef crisps are the smell that I get off the leaves. And indeed, people have used this plant for foraging and have used the leaves to make sauce to go with roast beef. And one of its names is ale hoof or gill over the ground. And it was used in Saxon times for brewing ale in the period before people started using hops for making ale into beer. And in fact, and it's got a long history of use in traditional medicine as well. And if you go into the old herbalist books like Gerard's Herbal. It's recommended for lots of different things. As always, I'll give my usual health warning. Do not use this without seeking medical advice. I don't think there's been a huge amount of scientific research into its effect as a foodstuff or a medicine for humans. So as always, I would advise caution and research and getting advice before you start filling your belly with any glaucoma heteracea. But as a house plant, well, does it have some merits? As a European native, it's a bit like heterohelix. When you're dealing with it as an indoor plant, it needs cool conditions. It's not going to like being blasted by your heating. Uh, so ideally an unheated room or a cool porch or somewhere where it can live a relatively unheated life. I did find it in one house plant book listed as a suitable plant to put in a terrarium. I've, that book came out in 1997. That kind of shocked me because this plant is fast growing and it would very, very quickly take over to a terrarium. So I'm not quite sure where that idea came from. Although, interestingly, I saw somebody on Facebook the other day who had a terrarium glass cabinet set up and they'd found a plant in a crack in the paving outside and they put it in their terrarium and lo and behold I was able to tell them that that plant was geranium robertianum also known as herb robert which is a very common weed uh, around Europe and parts of Asia so <laughs> Um, I guess the only limitations we're putting on what we grow indoors are our own conceptions in many ways it's worth saying that in North America, as I say, this plant is an invasive. So again, perhaps for the North Americans listening, it's best for this plant to remain back in the past <laughs> as a house plant, because the trouble is people start growing stuff and then chucking it away when they've got fed up with it. And this plant being rather clever at keeping itself alive will then start colonising the ground. So if you're in warmer climates and you do have this plant, it is worth being careful with how you treat it but it is worth saying the variegated form which is usually what's grown as a house plant is probably a bit less virulent than the plain green one having searched around it does come up for sale occasionally i have seen it uh on various american nursery websites the variegated form i mean and in the uk as well jay parkers who are a famous plant and bulb company they certainly have sold it in the past as a basket plant. And here in the UK, where it's obviously a wild native plant, it's sometimes sold by companies uh, on the basis that it provides excellent early nectar and pollen for pollinators because those purple flowers come early in the year. And number two is a member of the Poaceae family. Now, there's not many houseplants that come from that plant family, but this is one of them, a Plismanus hertellus, sometimes known as basket grass. But if you look at the variegated form, well, you'll probably think that it is a Tradescantia because it has that same Tradescantia look, trailing stems with stripy cream and green leaves on it that sometimes have a tinge of pink. Unlike Glaucoma heteracea, the ground ivy, this one is native to tropical and subtropical countries all across the southern hemisphere. 
And yet again, this is causing a problem in North America. This plant is an invasive. Again, possibly a reason that we aren't growing it. The Reader's Digest book, Success with Houseplants, which I think came out in 79, suggests growing these plants in small hanging baskets. And just like its doppelganger, the Tradescantia, it's a kind of a short-lived perennial. So after a, a, a while, it starts to look a bit as I would say in my household, rampity. No idea if that's a real word. Um, So then you would just take some cuttings and replace it. Because if this plant isn't getting enough light, it will do exactly like a Tradescantia and become rather leggy. So why did we stop growing a Plismanus hotelus as a houseplant? Well, I haven't really got to the bottom of that one. Perhaps Tradescantias just took over as more popular and the wheel of fashion just turned away from this plant. Or maybe just people didn't like the name of Plismanus. One other source, the Amateur Gardening in 1970, recommended planting a table bowl display with a Plismanus arrayed around the edge of the bowl, trailing over, which sounds rather attractive. Personally, I've always wondered whether this plant, along with Tradescantias, would make a great specimen for a green wall. I can't see why it wouldn't work really well. It would cover loads of space and offer great texture. If I can get hold of a Plismanus, maybe I should give it a go. And the final plant in my trio of extinct house plants is from the Liliaceae family, the Lily family, and it's Ophiopogon. Sounds like a, an alien from the Star Trek universe, but no, it is commonly known as lily turf or mondo grass or snake beard, a strappy grassy plant with stripy creamy leaves and white flowers, most often found in the, you guessed it, variegated form, which has got cream striped leaves. You'll still find this commonly sold as an outside nursery plant, but nobody seems to be growing it indoors anymore. Again, it's listed in quite a few of the houseplant books I've got that range from the 70s to the 90s, but just doesn't seem to be offered up anymore as a houseplant. There are a few different species of Ophiopogon. The one we're talking about that is grown indoors or was grown indoors is Ophiopogon jabaran, whereas the other two species we've talked about are quite wide in their native distribution. This one is just native to Korea and Japan. The flowers remind me rather of Sansevieria flowers, those kind of white spikes clustered with tubular flowers. Sadly, no scent in this case, though. And like the spider plants, there are a number of different types of variegated cultivars you can get with different combinations of cream and green. And you guessed it, it's another plant that likes cool conditions. I think we're establishing a theme here. (laughs) Perhaps central heating uh, and wanting to keep our homes at a steady 20 degrees centigrade has meant that these kind of plants just aren't suitable for us anymore. But like the others we've mentioned, this one likes to be kept cool, needs plenty of light, but not bright direct sunlight in the middle of summer. So if you do have an unheated space, this might be a good one to choose. I think it's interesting to see how these houseplants, which are cooler temperature plants, have definitely lost traction in the home. Another one I can think of would be Fatia japonica, the false castor oil plant with those beautiful, big, glossy palmate leaves. Looks incredible in the house, but actually most of us have homes that are too warm. Perhaps as climate change begins to force us to put our thermostats down some of these plants will be coming back into circulation i don't know i would love to hear from you about your thoughts on these three extinct in inverted commas house plants have you grown them have you seen them anywhere inside and what other plants do you think we should get back into our homes that we used to grow in the past do check out the show notes for some links to pictures of the three plants if you can't visualise them. And as ever, I'd love to hear from you about the new plants that you're getting excited about, or perhaps the old ones that have been old faithfuls for you for many years. (laughs) 
that's all for this week's show. I'm keeping it short and sweet this week. I will be back next Friday, but until then, enjoy your houseplants, treasure them, and hopefully they'll keep you on an even keel. Bye! The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Young by Komiku, and Whistle by Benjamin Banger. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes for details.